brother into the hands of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. He who sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer, by whose stripes we are healed and in whose name alone we have salvation. Let us then recall to mind the life of our dear brother and in humble trust hear the words of Holy Scripture. May the now listen to a hymn, Abide With Me. turn to you in the sorrow and grief of our bereavement, praying that we may find the strength we need in your sustaining grace, so that even as we mourn the death of one whom we knew and loved, we may not be overcome by this trial, but may hold fast, trusting in your goodness and your mercy. Assure us, O oh Lord, O oh God, that death is not the end of those who trust in you. And may our hearts be so composed in the Holy Spirit that all fear and bitterness may be swallowed up in the light and peace you give to your troubled children. 
through Jesus Christ, our oh Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, who by the Holy Spirit ministers to us in our weakness. And by the victory of your Son, Jesus Christ, has given us the pledge of eternal life. Lift us, we pray, above our present distress and sorrow, and shed the light of your grace and glory upon us through the name of, through the same Jesus Christ, O oh Lord. Amen. 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 We're now going to have a reading from the Word of God from the Old Testament book of Psalm. Psalm 90, verse 1 to 14. And Michelle is going to read for us. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, and you brought forth the whole world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our inquietudes before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. For if only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that ensures you. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you very much, Michelle, for sharing that word of God with us. We're going to sing again another hymn, and the hymn is Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Thank mm -hmm. you.
a word, word from the eulogy as written, and I believe will be presented by my dear brother, Mr. George Pippin. Good evening, Good evening. friends and family. Uh, it is with a heavy heart that I speak about my long-time friend, my brother, my everything. Nanda Dufo was born Kornabo in 1936, in the rural town of Abasi in Ashanti region, about 65 kilometers from the city of Kumasi, to Openin Kograndu 4 and Mame Yagunadu, both of blessed memory. He was the second of four sons and two daughters of his mother. The man's boyhood in his native Abasi was one of hardship. His father was unable to care for him, and he was rescued by his maternal uncles. One such uncle was Mr. Ose, who enrolled Anna at Abasi Methodist Primary School. And this explains why he has Ose in his name. At class three, he left for Mampong to live with another uncle who was a teacher to continue with his schooling. Suddenly, while he was in Form 1, his uncle, Mr. Prempong, with whom he was living, abandoned his teaching career. So Nana had to move back to his native Abasi to complete his middle school education. And he did so successfully in 1952 at Wadmasi Middle School. He got a teaching appointment at Bamboy in the Northern region after his middle, education, middle school education. He was there for one year and then moved to Tamale with, to live with another uncle, whom he always referred to as Uncle Robert. He worked at the labor office in Tamale for two years and was transferred to Konango in Ashanti region. While in Konango, he got acquainted with one Mr. Baden, who later became one of Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's trusted comrades. Through Mr. Baden, Nana secured a job in the government of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah and worked specifically at the Bureau of African Affairs for three years before moving to UK in 1966 at the youthful age of 27. On arrival in UK, he lived initially in South London, and later moved to Herringay, North London, where he settled with his uncle, Mr. Yado. He worked initially at the Cumberland Hotel in Marble Arch as a concierge desk clerk, and later with general accident as a senior insurance claims investigator. As a young man, Anna fell in love with his first wife, Miss Rosemary Fia Ejiwa, while on holidays in Ghana in the 1970s, got married and had a son, Kwame Osedu for senior. That is with us at the moment. Later on in their marriage, the relationship remounded. The marriage broke down, resulting in, in, in divorce. But he was not daunted by this experience in his life. So in 1989, he met Miss Mavis Usuansa and got married to her, with whom they have a son, Kwame Ose Dufo, and a daughter, Michelle Kwame Dufo. Mm -hmm. Nana was essentially a self made man. He was motivated by self help as an essential ingredient in personal development. 
He hungered after educational achievements. And while in UK, Nana achieved qualifications in English and insurance. Eloquent and passionate, Nana was a blunt, combative, and highly intelligent debater. He was very articulate in the socio-political life of Britain. He indeed exuded the typical English persona. Nana was an astute investor in stocks and shares. He was so successful in buying and selling of shares that he made it a mission to share his knowledge of the money markets with family and friends. He owned shares in blue chip companies such as British Telecom, Lloyd's, TSB, and HSB banks. He made it a passion to sit by the television set every morning. That's what I saw him, scrolling through British BBC teletext and following the daily movements in shares and stocks on the money markets. He also invested in properties. In addition to his house at 45 the Avenue, Nana owned three properties in Ghana, one of which he has bequeathed to the town folk at Abbasi, at Abbasi as the chief's palace. I had known Nana a bit casually in the late 1980s and the early 1990s, but we started working very closely together and eventually became lifelong friends after the formation of the New Century Club. Admittedly, he enjoyed, we enjoyed each other's company so well that we were seen almost always together at various social events. We visited, we visited each other's home so regularly that we became members of each other's household. Conversations with him were always fun and were often peppered with amusing snippets about, about examples of his life from childhood to adulthood and sometimes about his other male siblings Abraham Nane and Kompuano, to be exact. <laughs> he was an active member of the New Century Club. Indeed, Nana was actively involved in the formation, organization, and development of the club. His financial contribution, as well as his support generally to the club, was immeasurable. The now defunct New Century Club owed him a great debt of gratitude. Nana loved music and he specifically retained a love for Jamaican reggae and contemporary Ghanaian her life songs till his later days on earth. And even though he was not the best of dancers, Nana would be the first person to take to the dancing floor whenever we had a bash. A bash. I can even visualize his moves as I stand here talking about him today. <laughs> Nana was a school chief of his hometown, Abasi, in 2002 after the tragic death of his maternal cousin, Nana Mwakwata. He was very passionate about the socioeconomic development of his township. Indeed, his mission was to help raise the social and economic conditions of his town folk. We discussed a number of transformational projects to get together. He initially embarked upon surveying and mapping of all the lands under his traditional jurisdiction. And we discussed converting his private house at Abase into a library for use by members of his community. We also discussed establishing viable income generating ventures such as plantation agriculture and agro-processing factories in his hometown. Sadly, none of these projects could materialize as planned because of Nana's sudden ill health. The mighty tree has fallen. And your death clearly brings to memory the lamentations of David in 2 Samuel 1.26. How are the mighty fallen? And the Bible continues, tell it not in Gath and publish it not in the streets of Ascalon. Here I will say, tell it not in Abasi and announce it not in the streets of Tottenham, London. I agree for you go as we constantly you know, refer to ourselves. You were very dear to me. Your love for me was exceptional. Your respect for me, even though you were clearly older than me, was wonderful. I remember one 
he was going to Ghana, and I had to see him off at the airport. And that day, that there was a heavy snowfall. So the chief could not go beyond a certain point. And when we got to Green Park, we were told that uh, the, 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 the train had terminated. So we had to find a way to get to Heathrow Airport. Mm -hmm. This time too, we were running late. The only alternative was to go and take the uh, Heathrow Express. And that was to go to another platform at Paddington with his heavy luggage. I was able to carry as much as I could and he also had to bring the rest. And when we got to the concourse of Paddington Station, the man turned to me and said, Ko Semen Shewa Nakamede. Literally, if I hadn't met you, what would I have done? It touched my heart. That was the third of our friendship. As in the case of your forefathers, you have crossed over from the land of your people to a new place where there's no pain, where there's no sickness, where there's no sorrow, where there's no stress, where there's no anxiety, where there's no agony, where there's no worry, and number four, where there's no fear of illness. I believe you are now in the bosom of the Almighty. I will forever remember you with nostalgia, as I always remember the ordeal, the agony and the pain that you endured throughout your illness. You were undoubtedly a warrior. According to, according to Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 19, 1 to 9, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and that you have only abandoned your fleshy body. You are not even dead, but just asleep. You will be awakened and raised up in glory like those who died in the Lord. Your death is only a change to a better place. I miss you so much. I have, the, I have a great sense. I have that great sense of a great loss. You will live forever in my memory. How can I mourn you, Ko? Ko, the year. Demi Fedye. Demi Fedye. Demi Fedye. I miss you so much. Oh, Ko, I miss you. I miss you. <laughs> Thank George very much for sharing that eulogy of the life and times of our dear brother with us. We can see it from his emotion, the impact, the passing of him. I know that they were very close. So I know that he feels the loss of his dear brother and mentor. We will continue to hear tributes. And the next tribute is from his wife, Mavis.
I met Nana. It was through my uncle, Charles Apia, was a good friend of Nana. And Charles was um, My uncle Charles asked me to bring a gift to Nana. So I sent the gift, I bring it down to London and I bring Nana to come and take his gift. When Nana came to the house, Nana said to my uncle, he wants to marry me. And I said, oh, you this man with Married women, you come and say you want to marry me, no, no. And Nana said, listen, ladies, I'm a bachelor. <laughs> He's so funny person. And I said, my uncle said, okay. So from there, we all start laughing and we join together. And in the evening, when I come back from where I've been and Nana is out, he will call me on my phone and we will have a word, you have a word with Nana. So Nana said to me, when are you going back to Ghana? And I said to Nana, I'll be going in um, two weeks time. So he said to me, okay, I'll come to the airport to see you off. When he came, he just put his hand in his pocket and pull out his key. And he just take the key and say, look, anytime you come to London, this is my key. You can come in my house anytime. I look at him and say, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to your house. So I just went back to Ghana. And it started from there. Dana was an insurance man, as George said, and a very hard working person. Genoa accident was where he was working in High Park Corner. He has worked for 29, was it 29 years of working in this company. And moreover, he's a very caring man. He cared for his family. Not only his family, he also cared back home as well. He's a great man, they call him, the name they always call him back home is Nana Abba Sehim. That was his name. And he has a title alias Abiyam. May your soul rest in perfect peace, Nana. Thank you very much, Mavis, for sharing that tribute us. Now we'll have a tribute from the children written by Kwame Senior.
Good evening. Good evening. As we are all aware, it's been a very challenging time for Kwame and his siblings. So um, we got here about one. And looking at Kwame, I offered to read on behalf of Kwame and his siblings. So, oh, Dad. We all knew this sad event was going to happen one day due to the deterioration of your health over the last 18 months. But we never expected this to, the Jan to January the 3rd, 2021. The Lord gives and the Lord takes. Job 1.21. Rest in peace, God. This evening, we mourn at your demise. A very sad moment. It's sunny man here, and I'm with my brother's family and my little sister. Your one and only Mamiya. We want to say thank you for having you as our dad. The most knowledgeable, funniest, and greatest man we know. It's been two months since you left us. And I speak on behalf of my siblings. The pain of losing you in our lives doesn't get any easier. But I know you will say, son, take each day as it comes. You and your brother and your sister will be well. That is the father, that's the kind of father you were to us. You were always looking out for your children, constantly encouraging us to be the best that we can be. And you have always been proud of our achievements. As your children, we look back knowing that you loved us differently, nevertheless loved us all the same. For example, there were times Kwame was troublesome, but he was always able to make you laugh with his funny stories, dance, or interesting choice of health styles over the years. That is, the, that is why Kwame will miss coming home and shouting, big man, to greet you, and having a little giggle and laugh with you in the evening. I always remember when we as a family went to Mama Yaa's graduation at North Fountain University. The week leading to her big day, you kept calling me every day about the arrangements. Sonny man, have you hired a car for Mamiya? Because your sports car is too small for all of us. <laughs> then, next day, you said, Sonny man, is the high car a big car? Then I remember you said, in your stern voice, hey, my friend, make sure it is a Mercedes Benz. <laughs> each time I replied, okay, that I will sort it. And each time I talk, as for this man, he thinks her daughter is a queen of Sheba. <laughs> In any case, my brother, and I always knew Mami Ya was your one and only girl, your favorite one, and yes, your Queen of Sheba. Because on the day of her graduation, I will never forget how proud you were of her. 
In fact, in your last visit to Ghana in 2017, I remember watching a, clip, a video clip of Mamia surprising you at the palace. You obviously was not expecting her. So your reaction to her impromptu visit was priceless. You shouted with delight. Mamia, I miss you so much. Why do you surprise me like this? Oh, Mamia, you are a naughty little girl. <laughs> and you laughed and danced around her. It was clear to see your love and happiness of seeing your little girl. The reason why I distinctly remember this moment that was because my sister couldn't help herself but to forward the video clip to my phone with that caption. I said to you, bro, this is the proof I am daddy's favorite. <laughs> I like to think you were also proud of me too. In fact, one of my fondest and best moment, memory, memory with you is when you treated me to an all expenses paid trip to Ghana, all because I graduated from uni. It was just you and I enjoying Ghana together. You showed me off to all your family and friends. The fun we had, I will never forget. Oh, I will never forget to try. In all honesty, and from the bottom of my heart, we were immensely proud of you being our father, and also being the father to the people of your hometown in Abbas, in Ghana. From the time you were appointed Abbas Ibni, Nana Osei before again of Abasi, Western region, he took your responsibility very seriously because we knew how much your hometown and the people meant to you and how important it was for you to build your hometown up when you were alive. This is why it is only right to send your body and your soul back home to your rightful resting place amongst the great ancestors, so that we leave before we send you back home as the eldest child of yours. What else can I say about you than to say, Jeremy Fadier, the year that so on behalf of my brother, sister, and I, we truly blessed and honored to have been able to call you our dad. You have helped to shape the people we are now. I earnestly believe in the well-known phrase, those who love, those who love the most never go away. They walk beside us every day. It, is, it applies to you that. Enjoy your eternal rest, dear dad, in the arms of our God. <laughs> very much my brother for sharing that tribute from the children with us. We've been talking for a while, so now we're going to sing, and our next hymn is In Christ Alone. Thank you. 
second scripture reading from the New Testament book of Revelation chapter 21 verse 1 to 6 and Kwame Jr. will read for us Revelations 21, verse 1 to 6. Then I saw a new heaven, a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and they be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things have passed away. He said to me, it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of the life. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. 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 
Thank you, Reverend Kwame, for that reading from the Word of God. Let me express words of condolence to Mavis, the children, or the members of family, friends, and the passing of our dear brother. I'll just say Nana because that's what I've called him ever since I know him. So I'll just say Nana. I bring condolences from the Miller Memorial Methodist Church where Nana and the family have been members over the years. I've known Nana now for about seven years. That's as long as I'm in the, at Miller Memorial Methodist Church. And he always referred to himself when he's talking to me as the prodigal son. <laughs> he said, oh, Reverend, they call me Osafo. I'm coming to church. <laughs> yeah, the prodigal will come. He always said, the prodigal will come. So that's what he refers to himself. But we, we had a good relationship for the short time and now, man. And I'm very happy today that during his illness I was able to be there for him as his minister. Visiting him in the hospital on several occasions, visiting him at home even in his last days. And I know he will be greatly missed, but God has seen his best to call him home. And God knows what's best. God knew that he had enough of this world, he had enough of the pain and the suffering. And he brought, he gave him that relief. He saw that the relief came through death. But God knows best. So all we can do is to thank God for our memories of him and to pray that his soul will continue to rest in peace. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we come into your presence even at this time. You know the heaviness of our hearts, oh God. For in Christ, you know our feelings because you have been there. You lost your son. And even Jesus, when his friend died, he cried. The Bible tells us that Jesus wept. So he understands our feelings. And we thank you that you're here with us at this time. And we ask for the consolation and the strength of your Holy Spirit with that assurance that you will never leave us nor forsake us. Even this time you are with us. So continue to bless us as we give you praise, honor, glory, and thanks. In Jesus' name. Amen. I want to say to us that the passing of a loved one, someone who has been near and dear to us, will undoubtedly be the most difficult situation any human being will encounter in his or her lifetime. It is a situation that is inevitable. And it's also one that as human beings we do not have any control over. You know, as human beings, and if you're anything like me, I like to be in control of my situation. The worst thing you can, can, could happen to me is to feel that I'm in a situation over which I have no control. But death is that one aspect of our life that none of us will have any control over. And it makes no difference whether the person who has passed was young or age whether the passing was sudden or in a sense expected. You see, as human beings, there are several adverse situations that come into our lives, but we seem always to have the ability to circumvent those situations, to find a way. We are very clever human beings, you know. We always find a way around everything. But my brothers and sisters, when our number comes up and God calls us, Regardless who we are, regardless where we have been, regardless how affluent we are, how much we have, there's nothing we can do about it. We have to answer that call. And it makes it an even more 
challenging occurrence. When our number is called and we are not ready. As a minister, I get to see a lot of this, a lot of people who are terminally ill, people who are dying. I've sat with people while they have transitioned from this life to the eternity. And there are always two scenarios, one or two scenarios. You find those who are clearly not ready to go. And a, a struggle has ensued because they do not want to go, but they have no choice. I've actually heard someone say, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> well, did he have a choice? And the other scenario is that you're with some people and they transition peacefully. Some of them seem like they can't wait. I was with a lady once and she said to me, Reverend, they are coming. They have all their white dresses. I need my shoes to go with them. And my dad, who was a preacher, always said to me, when you hear people talking like that, they are transitioning. They know where they're going and they're in a hurry to go. People in white are coming for her. And she wants her shoe. And she was in a hospice, you know, and walked for, for months. But she wanted her shoe to go with them. That shows that she's ready. She cannot wait. My dad said to me when he was dying, he said, Look, I didn't come here to turn stone. I'm ready to go. And I said to him, What hurry are you in? Wait. He said, No, I am ready to go. My brothers and sisters, in such a challenging situation, the words of scripture can be informative, consoling, and assuring to us. We need to look to the word of scripture so that we can find strength, consolation, and solace in our time of grief. And both of our scripture lessons that were read for us today bears evidence of shared experiences and thus provide us with much needed assurance even in the midst of the death of a loved one. Psalm 90. The psalmist speaks about the importance of knowing the God that we are called to serve. And that psalm is part of a prayer which recognizes some very important characteristics about the God that we are called to serve, Jehovah God. Firstly, the psalmist recognized the everlasting nature of God and the resulting effects that has on people's life. He says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth. Or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Amen. We serve a God who is everlasting. Amen. Amen. We serve a God who is not just a God of the good times, Amen. but a God in every situation, Amen. at every moment of our life. Yes. You know, sometimes we, we live in a world where people say they love you. And some even say, oh, I'll care for you, I'll look out for you. But when you're in deep, dire stress, when you're in a sad situation, you know you can't find them? <laughs> Even though some of them mean good, they have to look after their own situation. They don't have no time with you. They have their own business to deal yeah. with. But thanks be to God, we serve a God. Amen. Regardless what the situation in the world is, He has time for us individually yes. and collectively. Yes. From everlasting to everlasting, Amen. He is God. And he was God from time immemorial. Even before the world was in place, even before we were created, he has been God and he has been our dwelling place. Our God is not an amateur. He doesn't have to wonder what to do with us. He knows what we need because he made us, he created us. He understands us even more than we understand ourselves. He has been our dwelling place from time immemorial. That means he has been a refuge for his people. 
He has been a home for his people. He has been a safe haven for his people ever since. You see, a prayer which represents the experience of people who painfully endured the wrath of God as a result of their sinfulness and disobedience. The writer of this psalm speaks from experience because he has been through. He speaks of the time when because of his sinfulness and his disobedience that he actually felt the wrath of God on his life. So he's a man who knows what he's saying. And what he's saying to us is that life will not always be plain sailing. He had his fair share of adversity throughout his lifetime. And we will have our own. You know, sometimes I listen to the television, especially during this COVID pandemic. And I hear people complaining endlessly. And I sit there thinking, even as Christians, Jesus calls us, but he never promises us a bed of roses. He said, if any man wants to follow me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. That's not plain sailing. What he's saying is that there will be rough times, there will be rugged pathways, there will be uphill, there will be downhill, but whatever the situation is, our God is with us. Whatever the situation is, we have a friend in Jesus Christ. With Christ in our vessel, we can smile at the storm. Life is filled with challenges, struggle, sorrow, hardship, and disappointment. And I believe that Nana had his fair share. As I listened to the eulogy and the tributes, I know there were good points in his life. But I also believe, especially with his upbringing, that he suffered. But that didn't stop him from achieving what he wanted to achieve. He became the man he wanted to be because he was persistent, he persevered, and he was determined, he was ambitious. And best of all, God was with him throughout his life. Amen. Amen. You see, the psalmist speaks of the fact that he recognizes who God is and the goodness of God. And even though that he, the people in this time were experiencing their life cut short by death. That does not make God any less than our God. The Bible says that God has given us three score and ten. And by reason of health and strength, we may go on to four score. Now the past is four score. Four score is eighty. Yeah. So he had a bit extra. So God has been good to him. And these were the days when people were living all seven, eight hundred years when this psalm was written. And he's talking about life cut short. I buried a friend of mine the other day. He was only 40 something. And he's saying here that life is short. But in today's terms, Nana had a bit extra. You see? Yeah. But what he was really saying is that, listen, I want people to know that their days are numbered. Each one of us have a time to live. The Bible itself tells us it's a time to be born, a time to die, and that there's a time for everything under the sun. And what I like is that the psalmist realized, well, listen, one day his number will come up. And he has no control, he will have to go. And you know what he turned around and said? God, teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. What he's saying, Lord, show me how long my life is, and that I will use my short time here on earth to the best of my ability, praising you, seeking your wisdom, and achieving what you have purposed for my life. A lot of people go through life aimlessly. 
and they mistake living with surviving. A lot of people survive for a very long time, maybe 80, 90 years, and they haven't lived. And what do I mean by that? You cannot wake up every morning and just expect to go through the day and see where the day takes you. That's not living. You have to be intentional about what you do during the day. If God has blessed you with a new day, God will give you the wisdom to do the things that you ought to do. And part of that living, we have to make time for the things of God. A lot of people rule God out of their lives. They figure they could live on their own. They could do this on their own. But my brothers and sisters, I want to say to us that we need God. Yes. And I believe that throughout Nana's busy life, he knew that there was a God because he was a member of the church. He came to church when he was able. And I believe that he had a place in him for God. And that is most important. Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom, that we may understand what is God's purpose for us. You see, my brothers and sisters, if, if we think that we're going to live forever, we could live how we like. But when we know that it is appointed unto us a certain time to die, the psalmist is saying, let us ask God to bless us with wisdom so that we can live that life productively, righteously, and positively. Awareness of our mortality ought to bring about a consciousness. And not just a, con to con just a consciousness. But it ought to sensitize us to the fact that we will be accountable to God. I'm here for a while. And after this life is taken from me, I have to give an account to God for the life I have lived. I believe most of Ghana or Africa, I might be the only one from the Caribbean. <laughs> but in the Caribbean, we have this saying, especially for those who don't have a fear of God, that when you're dead, you're done. That's saying it colloquially. What they're saying, I can live any old way because I'm going to die anyway, and when I die, that's the end of it. But I want to say to us, that's not what the Word of God teaches. The Word of God teaches that after we die, we have to give an account to God for our life. And if we are going to die and stay dead, how can we give an account to God? The Bible said he shall judge the living and the dead. You cannot judge a, 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 a dead person. The person has to be able to answer him or, for him or herself, otherwise that would not be justice. So that tells me, brothers and sisters, that there is life after death. And the Bible goes further, he said that God in Christ will come back for his people and he will take them to be with him. And that's what the book of Revelation was telling us in the reading we had this evening. That John, the apostle John, was exiled on the Isle of Patmos and he had this vision of the hereafter. And he said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And I saw people adorned as a bride adorned for her husband. And he saw a glimpse of what the hereafter would be, what heaven is like. And John said when he questioned it, he was told to write these things down, for they are faithful and true. And he saw this life where there would be no more pain, as George was telling us in the eulogy, where there would be no more pain, no more worries, no more hatred. We don't have to lock any door. We don't have to pay no council tax. We don't even worry about COVID. Uh, we will be in that place where not even sickness or death can trouble our bodies. I want to say to us that I believe that when a child of God passes, Immediately after the breath leaves their body, their soul enters that place. Amen. And the soul waits for the time when the judgment of God, when that person would be resurrected like Christ and be 
in a position to account for him or herself. First Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us that Paul said, I do not want you to be uninformed or be ignorant, brothers and sisters, about those who have died. That there's coming a day when the trump of God shall sound, and the Son of Man shall descend from heaven. And he would call those who have died in Christ first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up with them to meet Jesus Christ in the end. And he says, comfort one another with these words. Comfort ourselves knowing that whether we live or we die, we are God's. We belong to God. God does not abandon us when we death, when we die. He is still our God. He still loves us the same. He still cares for us the same. We are just waiting. Death is not the end. It's a transitional stage. And we are waiting to that time when we will receive our reward for the way we have lived in this world in this time. Not has served his time. He has passed from this life to the greater life. Let us release him. Last time I saw him, he didn't even know I was there. And I could have seen that he was going down. So let's release him now that God has seen it fit to call him. Let us release him. Let, him, let his soul take its rest. We are never going to forget him. We are not going to stop, stop loving him. But we are releasing him so that he can be at rest in the Lord. My brother, may your soul take its flight. May the holy angels receive you. May Christ himself welcome you. And may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit continue to be with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand as we commend our brother into the hands of Almighty God. Let us commend our brother Nana to God's faithful and eternal keeping. Since the earthly life of our brother has come to an end, we commend him to God's safekeeping. We entrust his soul to the God who has created him. We who are left behind will not mourn like people without hope. But we are living with the assurance that God in his mercy will see us through this life. And there will be a reunion where we will meet our brother on the other side. Go forth, my brother. Take your rest. And we commend you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please sit and let us pray. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Praise be to you, O God, our Father, who created us in your image for eternal fellowship with you. Praise and thanksgiving to you, O Christ, O Lord, and O God, who has overcome the sharpness of death and opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers, and are now seated at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. Praise and blessing be to you, Holy Spirit, God, our Comforter, who bears witness within us of our acceptance with the Father and have become the pledge of our eternal inheritance. 
We bless your name for the life of our dear Nana whom we let to rest. We give you thanks for the joy and blessing his life has brought to others. For his service to his generation according to your will and for every happy remembrance of his life. We bless you for your mercy and goodness which has followed him all the days of his life. And now the trials of this world are over and death itself is past. We ask that you receive him into your perfect kingdom and bring us with all who have lived and served you faithfully to the fullness of your eternal joy through Jesus Christ, O oh Lord. Amen. Amen. We have another hymn, final hymn, It is well with my soul. Jesus again from the dead, the eternal Father, the giver of life. May he come into our hearts and abide with us. As we send forth our brother, so we also go forth back into the world to love and to serve. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. This is going to be a period of dream. I'd just like to ask us that we do it orderly and with the COVID restrictions still in place. <laughs> Social distancing wearing our masks. We can't be good, let us be careful. Amen. 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 Amen.
You know they recognize you when I came first. <laughs>